Okay, um, thank you very Recording much. Recording in Actually, progress. Uh, so for this lecture, I actually didn't get a chance to prepare slides in advance, so I'm going to write as I go. And what I want to discuss today is how to do some computations with um, Witten diagrams, just like in traditional ADS CFP, <clears throat> but in, in this uh, topological string context. So what we're going to do is we'll build a chiral algebra by, by studying the topological string on SLGC. We're going to do what we've done so far. We've related infinite dimensional symmetry algebras. on the gauge theory side. And the holographic dual. We've seen that these are the same. And the main result we'll be able to do today Theorem, which will use, use this fact in the proof, the planar gauge theory chiral algebra is isomorphic to the holographic. So we'll be able to show that we can match all of the OPE coefficients, and in particular, all correlators. So the first thing we need to do to understand this is to understand how to build the holographic chiral algebra. So we started discussing this a little bit yesterday. So recall from yesterday that SL2C has a compactification where the boundary is CP1 times CP1. So I'm going to give an explicit description of the geometry near the bound. on a path near the boundary, we have coordinates Z in C. This will be the chiral algebra plane. So this can be thought of as the boundary of ADS3. W in CP1 and also N, which is normal to the boundary. N really lives on a, a line bundle over CP1. So I explain in a second, it's related to the Hopf vibration. 
which means that n has a pole. When w is infinity, in other words, n transforms like dw of the half. It is spin half flow. So these coordinates we're going to use are related to the coordinates on ADS 3 times S3 as follows. If we write n equals or e to the i theta, then z, z bar, and or or coordinates on ADS3, really, really mutating at ADS3, and the boundary is or equals zero. W, W bar, and theta are coordinates on the tree sphere, which we're seeing as a hop vibration over CP1. <clears throat> the T, the coordinate parameterizes the hop fiber. So, that's it. So the goal is, is to build a chiral algebra living on the Z plane by studying hop. And the gravitational engaged theory we have in the book. So, to get there, we need a few more details of the geometry. Well, Z is not a holomorphic coordinate. There is a Beltrami differential. Which looks like mu is factor of n. I'm going to drop some factors of pi n squared. <clears throat> so this may look a little funny, but if you can remember that n transforms like the square root of dw, so n squared transforms as w, this expression here includes a natural volume form in CP1. So it's a, it's a natural expression. And also, to, because our bulk theory, we're going to be focusing on the open string set because it's easier. And the bulk Lagrangian is the holomorphic transhymus Lagrangian. So that involves a holomorphic volume form of this geometry. So I need to write that, write that down too. Oh my God. It has a whole of order three. Let me just get it. We calculate it in these coordinates, it looks like this. So it's important to note that if we look over here, we can, there will be a piece of this which looks like d theta d times the volume form of the two sphere times n. 
So from this, you see that the integral over the three sphere of omega is equal to n, as we would expect. Okay, so, so far we've just set up the coordinates. Are there any questions? No question at this stage. Okay, I actually can't see you guys anymore for some reason, but it's no big deal. So recall the homomorphic term Simon's with quarantine. We're going to have a gauge field, because there's zero one form in this geometry, if I leave an SLA. And it looks like half uh, integral trace A d bar A plus one over six trace A A A. And this whole thing is hit with the homomorphic problem. So to describe the, the holographic chiral algebra, we have to first describe boundary conditions at n equals zero. This is on the boundary of our geometry. And then states will violate boundary condition at some value of z. The natural boundary condition, if you spend a little time thinking about it, it's a little subtle, but we notice that omega has a pole over three. It turns out that asking that a has a zero is a good boundary condition. So if we ask that a goes like n, near n equals zero is a good boundary condition. Wait, so now, now we can ask what is a state? And the answer is of course we're gonna modify the boundary behavior at some value z. For example, we could ask that a goes like a delta function and z equals z zero plus o n. This is gonna be the simplest lowest lying state. So in a moment, I, wanna ma I will match these with the states in the chiral algebra. But for now, well, if one says ordinary ADCFT, he might say, well, what you really want is a solution to the equations of motion on the bulk geometry, which satisfies this boundary condition. And we can find such a thing. You can show that there is a unique top gauge equivalence solution to the linearized equation of motion. Which 
which is just the deep R equation, which satisfies this modified boundary condition. So this the explicit formula is a C zero is Let's introduce a color index DA plus right factors And constant factors of phi is going to look like this. So the reason this satisfies the equations of motion, we should recall that there was a Beltrami differential, so Z wasn't, uh, wasn't holomorphic. So if I take a delta function and a fixed value of Z, that doesn't satisfy the Debar equation. But this adding on this correction term, term makes it so it does. Well, I can draw a little picture of it by what this is. Here we have ADS3. This is the boundary of ADS3. My state. Sorry, Kevin, the uh, gauge yeah. index in the second term. Is TA is multiplied by TA or what? Yes, yes, the second term is multiplied by TA. Oh, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Right. So, what this looks like as I approach the boundary, the boundary is at n equals zero. As I approach the boundary, it decays rapidly here. So, it's zero zero as I approach the boundary. And if I move a little bit away from the boundary, it also decays. So this should be said minus zero. My apologies. Decays as Z moves away from Z zero. So this is the kind of thing you want for a state, right? On the boundary, it's localized at a particular point. As you move away from the boundary, it spreads out away from that point with some particular decay rate. The decay rate, of course, will be related to the two-point function. And that's good because this state is related to the current and the two-point function of the current goes like one over z squared. Okay, so we're gonna propose that a a z zero gets matched to the state j a it's at zero in the chirological. Well, this is the S away current, and that's written as and then there's some that's let me write my color indices like that. Or or an S1 from one to eight, and it's anti-symmetric of OS. So we'd like to also build to build the states that correspond to I or to these 
to these symmetrized faces, so this should be M. And what we'll find is that the ways of modifying the boundary condition at this point match precisely with the states in the CFT. So let's think about the most general way we can modify the boundary condition. So we could say A is like delta function that set equals set zero, but there's nothing stopping me having more singular behavior in N. So I could have one over N to some power, okay. But once I have that singular behavior in N, we could also think, well, why can't I have a function of W2? And the remaining terms are going to be terms which are less singular in N, whose inclusion will be forced by solving the equations of motion. Now, what possible values do we have here for these indices? I can have an arbitrary pole in N, but we know that N has a pole at W equals infinity. Which means one over N to the K has a zero of over K. Having a pole in the W plane would be bad because it would prevent my field configuration from satisfying the equations of motion. So we need that the index L ranges from zero to K. Well, this is perfect because these are exactly states with the right quantum numbers to match the states we see in the chiral algebra. So we propose that this corresponds to I'll give to the the uh, polar factor this corresponds to pi or x one l x two k minus l i s. In these states. Have the same quantum numbers. Okay. Any questions so far? Uh, nope. Okay. So I assume everything is. Crystal clear. So now we've described the states on the holographic dual side, we can ask how can we compute their, their endpoint functions? Let's say the two and three functions to start. 
Well, so the endpoint functions of these states are computed in principle by Witten diagrams. So let's start with the two function. So if I take my state a z zero, Right, let's go and one square dwr. Thanks. Take two such states. They're two point function. Is obtained by inserting into um. To the kinetic term of the homework turn signs to form. It's going to be integral over all my coordinates of a a zero. D bar A B B zero, and then when we contract indices, there's going to be a delta A B. So since these states correspond to the SOA current in my chiral algebra. These have a two point function which goes like N delta AB over C naught minus E one squared. So this is what we would like to reproduce. <clears throat> so just to remind you, <clears throat> the factor of one over z naught minus z one squared. You can see this because it's that's the you know standard central extension of a Cassini, and it contains a Cassini at level n just because that's the number of fields we have. We can also see it from these guys are like i i. I, I, you know, x is in the middle. And when I contract them, we do two weak contractions and there's a loop in the middle. So the loop in the middle contributes n and the two weak contractions contribute one over z zero minus z one squared. 
<coughs> oh, I forgot the crucial point to introduce the volume from there. So let me scroll up a little bit so we can see the formulas for these expressions. Each expression is pretty much the same. Here there'll be like a delta C equals C1. And here there'll be the same kind of thing with one over C minus C1 squared. So what I'd like to do is kind of quickly compute this integral explicitly. And we're going to be a little loose and I'll drop some terms which, which are not so important and, and just focus on the relevant terms. I can take the first one, I'll drop the color factors too. Got this one to be a delta function. Here, I'm gonna put d bar of uh, let's see. We did R A one, and the volume form looks like the n or n cubed. The W D C. This is the relevant term of the volume form, and we're because our geometry is non-compact. We're going to integrate over Z and W, and or n is. We're going to introduce a cutoff near the boundary of ADS3. Now, if we do integration by parts, this is a pure boundary integral. In the boundary term, we're going to get rid of the d bar. And we're going to find something like this. And n squared dw bar one plus w squared squared dn or n cubed dw dz. Oh, and I forgot a crucial term, which is one over z minus c one squared. <clears throat> this term here really appeared originally over here. Okay, so so all of them, you notice the integral is a total derivative. So you pick up the boundary term, and we just insert all the terms, and we get something that looks like this. And then we see we get a really nice answer because this will correctly reproduce the carried algebra two-point function. Why is that? The integral over w of dw dw bar one plus w squared squared, this is just the natural volume form in CP1 for the forbidden study metric. So this is, a, this is basically one, but it's, it's a multiple of pi. So that part goes away. The integral over z well because I have a delta function in the integrand, all that does is produces one over 
c0 minus c1 squared. And that looks good. And finally, we have an integral, contour integral over n. And we notice up here, we have an n squared. There we have an n cubed. So we get contour integral over n of dn over n. And that gives you, you know, 2 pi i, which is also important. So we do indeed find that the holographic two point function is correct. <clears throat> okay, any questions about this calculation? Uh, yes, there is a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kevin. I just got a little bit confused. Is the f integral, if you go up just before you did the integral, mm -hmm. right there. Are you, is, is this an integral over CP1 times CP1, or is it, um, is it over S2 times S3? Right. Well, up, up here, you this was an integral over, over SLTC, but I've removed the neighbor of the boundary. So here, when I go down to the boundary integral, this is really an integral over an S1 bundle over CP1 times CP1. Yeah. So where's the fifth coordinate then? I'm, I just got confused. It's N, you see, because N, the absolute value of n is, is fixed. So we're left with the angular value of n. Oh, okay. That's the point. And that, that, and that appears when we, um, you know, it, it's an integral, so I can, I can just remove, I can just compute it in a dense open set, as long as it converges. So I don't worry too much about the fact that it's a non-trivial circle bundle. Um, so in which case the integral becomes an integral over c times c times s1, and the integral over the s1 just gives us this contour integral here. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how about the three-point function? Then we will play the same game. If I take three states, We're going to get like with F, A, B, C integral with the six dimensional geometry. Um, freezing it like this, though, it, it turns. turns out to be a little tricky. And I personally prefer, well, in any holographic computation, I prefer to use the OBE rather than the three-point function. So how do we find the OBE? Well, the OPE, the object which when 
inserted into the two-point function gives with AC gives the three-point function. So what is that? This is just the you know, definition of the OP in general. Um, but there's a nice formula for it. The OPE is given by T bar inverse of this expression is the OPE. And you can imagine that as follows. There's my first state. And then here, D bar inverse is the propagator coming off of that. So why is this the OPE? If I insert a C, B2 times times the D bar, D bar of that, well, clearly the D bars cancel. Is the three point function. So the OPE is something that's actually easier to compute than the two-point function. So let me quickly explain the technique for doing that. So the technique for computing the OPE is well A A C zero looks like this. And it turns out that this is the bar. TB times D bar of one over C minus C one. So I can remove this state by a gauge transformation. However, in the presence of the other state, This gauge transformation has a non trivial effect. It sends this other state C zero to one over C. 0 minus C1, F A B C, T C, delta C equals C0, plus the other term. Now here we see the correct Casmudi OBE.
And of course, one can play this game with with all of the other states, so it's a little more complicated. Uh, there is a question, Kevin. Uh huh. Uh, in the last equation, how does the B index get uh, soaked up? Uh, because it remains free on the right hand side, but on the left hand side, it's just A A. Right. So the key, the B index is present in the gauge transformation. The gauge transformation is like oh, I see. T B over C minus C one. And I'm looking at the effect of this gauge transformation on this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this way, one can, in principle, or just by working really hard and thinking about standard Witten diagrams, try to compute all of the correlation functions of the tire algebra. However, that's really hard. And there's a shortcut. The shortcut is that we, we know, we've already checked that on both sides, there's this really big symmetry algebra. And that's gonna constrain everything really tightly. Um, and it, that will really help us to cut down the problem to a much, much simpler problem. So let me very briefly say why How, you know, we, it's already kind of obvious that this symmetry is present on the holographic side because it's just the gauge transformations. But it can, it can be helpful to think about the mode algebra from the holographic point of view. So just like a local operator is obtained by modifying the boundary conditions at a point, so we get a field that looks like a delta function at a point in the boundary, a mode will be a field configuration like, for example, some power of z, a delta function that's where z is on the circle. Maybe there might be some negative powers of n. plus some other stuff where the negative powers of n are localized on the circle. So we need to see, you know, and, you know, commutators of modes can be seen, can be computed using the same gauge transformation trick we just mentioned. So I want to briefly explain why does functions on SL2C, these are homomorphic functions, tensor SO8, live inside the mode algebra. The answer is very simple. If I take f, which is a homomorphic function on SL2C, f times ta times the delta function at z equals one, this expression satisfies the field equation. Was a. Even though Z is not homomorphic. So geometrically, 
what we're doing is we're just taking our holomorphic function and multiplying it by a delta function on a five manifold, which at infinity goes to this circle. This circle where z is one like that. And the reason this satisfies the field equation is just, this is closed. You know, the delta function, any, any five cycle is a closed one form and d bar f is zero because it's a homomorphic function. So in this way, we see that this global symmetry algebra really lives inside the modes of our chiral algebra. And how does that help us? We know that the commutators of modes of our states are given by the algebra function of SL2C, SLA. Now, if I take in any chiral algebra, the commutator of modes is some expression is an expression in terms of the OBE coefficients. So this relationship, it turns out to constrain all OBEs and so correlation functions uniquely and except the two point function of the stress energy tensor, which goes like one square. So in other words, once we know this result, that we have this huge symmetry algebra, and once we can identify the quantum numbers of the states, everything else is determined by a single parameter, n. <clears throat> we conclude that the holographic algebra It's isomorphic with planar CFT alpha. Okay, so I think I think I'll stop there. Thank you.